This is the Danger Close Podcast. Beyond the Books with me, Jack Carr. Welcome to the Danger Close Podcast, an Ironclad original presented by Navy Federal Credit Union. My guest today is Matthew Levitt. Matthew is at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, where he focuses on counterterrorism and intelligence, specifically Hezbollah. He also served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Intelligence and Analysis at the U.S. Department of Treasury, focused on terrorism financing. Previous to that, he was a counterterrorism intelligence analyst at the FBI. He is the author of Hamas, Politics, Charity, and Terrorism in the Service of Jihad, Negotiating Under Fire, Preserving Peace Talks in the Face of Terror Attacks, and Hezbollah, the Global Footprint of Lebanon's Party of God. He also has a podcast called Breaking Hezbollah's Golden Rule, which I highly recommend. And now, without further ado, Matthew Levitt. Hey, Matt, how are you? I'm so tired. Oh my goodness, I bet you've, uh, you're have you a busy guy these days. I like that light fixture behind you. Oh, thank you. This is where I write. It's a uh, it's a friend's house uh, in town that uh, doesn't have my three children, uh, wife, dog, mother in law. Um, so this is the quiet place where I come to where I come to write, uh, especially as I creep closer to to deadline. Um, I yeah, I bet. But uh, thank you for taking time to do this. I really appreciate um, you doing this. I was just noting uh, the Israeli Defense Force had just released a video. Um, and noted for the first time, it was right near the Rantisi Hospital, and they kind of walked people through there. And there's a tunnel right at the hospital. Uh, you know, uh, um, a naval Hamas naval commando home is right next door. They take you into the hospital. You can see, you know, the weapons are holding there. You can see clearly a motorcycle with bullet holes in it, presumably from the October seventh. So they, they they drove it in there. You can see the stuff, the makeshift bathroom and stuff. They clearly brought the hostages there. I, I think of it though because um it's the first time I've seen them come out and say that um this was um this was found and cleared by the is- Israeli version of 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 seal of the seals until 13. That's right. So until 13. I mean, them, I mean obviously these guys were involved were, were, they weren't sitting on their rear ends, right? They're they're at the front end, not the rear end. Of these things but it's the first time i've seen them come out publicly and talk about yeah they've been fairly uh secretive about that unit over the years there's a couple books and mentions here and there about it of course i put it in my in my last book but uh yeah usually they keep that on down though and that's one of the main the, one of the only regrets i have about my my 20 years in the in the seal teams is that i didn't get to do the exchange with flotilla 13 and i didn't get to go over there and uh spend a week observing training that sort of thing i would have loved to have gone over there and done yeah. that so didn't get to do that but uh you know that's uh, i was busy elsewhere so it was all it was all good it was a it was uh, definitely a, a busy 20 years but um let's jump into this and i wanted to ask you your background because i can see your your bio and uh podcast is amazing by the way i'm going to talk about that in a little bit i have one of your books right here the other ones are inbound i don't know where they where they are but i want to encourage everyone to get get those this one on hamas there's another one negotiating under fire and hezbollah the global footprint of lebanon's party of god um so i want to encourage everyone to get those and read them to add to their foundation you can leave negotiating under fire out it's the book version of my phd and i'm pretty sure all 10 copies that were sold are from my mother and, okay. <laughs> well i ordered one and it hasn't i ordered it like a month ago and it hasn't I'm arrived yet. so i'm wondering what your mom i'm probably getting it from your mom on ebay or something seriously you'll find the one that she resold on ebay <laughs> it might be it might be because I, I was surprised it hasn't uh, hadn't arrived yet um but i can see the, the background and everything that you've done but what led you down this path before we jump into israel and today and then history of hezbollah that leads up to today but what set you on this path to uh becoming so well versed in that part of the world and um hamas and hezbollah in particular i think we're all products of our experience in part like you know <laughs> You know, your, your your hopes and dreams drive some of what you do, and then you kind of ride the wave of life and you end up where you are. Um, I ended up starting my graduate uh, work, my, my master's and PhD at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts outside Boston, 
uh, the week of um, the Oslo Accords, 1993. And so that kind of really drove my graduate student experience. Uh, at the time at the Fletcher School, you had to have three areas of concentration. So mine were Middle East um, and uh, international security studies and uh, negotiation uh, mediation theory. And um, I ended up doing my PhD on um, the Israeli-Palestinian peace process. Um, my research was in 1997. Um, so, uh, right after a series of suicide bombings by Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad, coming on the heels of Jewish extremist uh, attacks, uh, in particular in Hebron with Barack Goldstein, um, the kidnapping of an American Israeli dual national Israeli soldier, kidnapping and murder of national waxmen. I think some people might be surprised that, you know, this, this October 7th massacre. Uh, involves so many hostages, and then people might be surprised to know taking a hostage has been a long, long Hamas modus operandi. What's different here is how many hostages and 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 how ruthless uh, and brutal everything was. But getting ahead of myself, anyway, I just kind of thought to myself, you know, there are a lot of people out there can try and think of constructive, creative ways to make it so everybody feels like they have some ownership over Jerusalem or the right of return for. Palestinians to a, a, the, if there were to be a Palestinian state or water rights or all these difficult things, and I'm not trying to minimize how complicated they are, but it just seemed very obvious to me that the really, really bad, violent guys and girls too on both sides uh, were, were out to undermine this peace process. You could expect this, by the way, in any peace process in a deeply divided situation, Sri Lanka, whatever. Um, so. I set out to develop a thesis for how could you kind of bubble wrap um, a peace process? What would you have to do? And to do that, I tried to see what, in what ways do, does a terrorist attack undermine the negotiation process? Um, my, my, my own credibility as a leader and negotiator to my own people, um, you, as a leader of your people, uh, and the views of my people as someone that we should be talking to, the, the legitimacy of the whole idea of negotiation, and then very, very technically, then if that is how it's undermined, what can you do to try and preserve that? And that led me to do field research in Israel, the West Bank, and the Gaza Strip in the summer of 1997. I got lucky in a sense, because that was weeks after, under the Oslo Accords, um, Palestinian, the Palestinian Authority was created and Palestinian leaders were coming from Tunis, Tunisia into the Gaza Strip um, and to a lesser extent, the enclave around Jericho. Uh, and so I found myself um, visiting the West Bank um, and uh, going to the Palestinian Legislative Council meetings in, um, in Ramallah, uh, going to the Gaza Strip and meeting with people who had just come in, uh, people who had, who had kind of made the turn, one individual who was believed to be a financier, for Palestinian militant groups of the um, uh, attack at the Munich Olympics and had kind of turned at this point and was the head of one of the Palestinian intelligence agencies and was, uh, I was told by all parties and after a few hours with him concluded myself seriously committed to a two-state solution. And then as part of that, when, during one of my meetings in Ramallah at the Palestinian, at the Palestinian Legislative Council, um, we're, we're, we're standing there, we're waiting for it to start, it's delayed, it's delayed, it's delayed, and then all of a sudden, all of the media starts tearing out of there, and there had been a, a double suicide bombing at the main outdoor um, market, Jerusalem, uh, Yehuda, and I had to try and find my way back into Israel uh, from the West Bank and try to go look at that, and you know, it became very clear to me um, that, um, and this is remembers this pre 9 11, um, certainly pre ISIS and all of that, that um, if you were going to try and promote the opportunity for there to be peace between these two peoples, the Israelis and the Palestinians, it's going to have to be a way to um, tone down violence and create space within which people can take risks with one another. Um, and build rapport and trust with one another over time. Otherwise, uh, this wasn't going to work. And that the biggest threat to this was acts of terrorism. So this, my, my, my PhD, uh, 
and one, and one of the books was was about this and how uh, Jewish terrorism and Islamist terrorism both undermined the uh, Oslo Accords um, uh, through 1997 was my study. And then that led me uh, to go work in government uh, in counterterrorism. And when I kind of came out, uh, wrote the book on Hamas, went back into government, came out, wrote the book on Hezbollah, and now here we are. And that was uh, time with the FBI and uh, Department of the Treasury, is that right? That's right. So, you know, basically, you know, uh, I, I, I came to Washington, D.C. to do last round of interviews for the, for the dissertation and ended up meeting with a friend who taken a job at the FBI, and he said, you know, they're starting up a domestic terrorism analytical unit and an international terrorism analytical unit. I don't know if you'd be interested, it's not agent level, but I said, well, I'll talk to people about it and make a long story short. Um, I got hired as an analyst, became a senior analyst very, very quickly in the international terrorism analysis unit um, and uh, stayed there through including 9-11, led the analytical team for flight 175, the second flight to the Trade Center. Um, I'd actually already put in to leave the FBI because I'd gone as high as I could go as an analyst and wanted to do a bunch of things like finally finish the PhD and write that book on Hamas. And then 9-11 happened. Um, and uh, you, you can imagine how quickly I ran down that hallway to pull back that paperwork. Uh, we did what had to get done. Um, and uh, and then I said thanks but no to a couple of options to kind of move laterally to from the FBI to you know, as a TDY uh, uh, to other agencies to be able to get out in the fintech world, teach, but most importantly, finally finish that PhD and write, write the Hamas book. And then later on, um, 2005, just as I decided it's not the right time for me to go back into government, not the right time for my family, uh, government came knocking uh, as part of the Intelligence Reform and Terrorism Prevention Act. Lots of government bureaucracy had changed, most famously the creation of DHS, and the creation of the National Counterterrorism Center, but all, not true, almost all of the 1811 of the law enforcement components in Treasury, or Secret Service, etc., had been moved to DHS, which still is uh, IRS criminal investigations, the one part left. And in that space, they created something called Terrorism and Financial Intelligence, TFI, uh, which included some pre-existing components of Treasury, the part that do sanctions in particular, the Department's Financial Intelligence Unit, FinCEN, they created something new, which would be the first and to the state still only intelligence agency resident within a finance ministry. And I was brought in to be the deputy chief or the deputy assistant secretary for that. And we did mostly counter terror finance and counter proliferation finance. So, kind of Iran nuclear and Hamas, Hezbollah, Al Qaeda, Al Qaeda in Iraq, which wasn't yet calling itself ISIS, but it soon would, uh, a lot of that stuff. There's a lot of, lot of uh, bleed over between the, the the podcast, my personal interests, and then my my novels, particularly in this case, uh, terrorism finance and how you move money and funds and how you communicate that. Um, so, uh, so, so here, here's morning, the you, you wind me up on like that energizer bunny. I can keep going. Right? Yeah, I teach well, a class I'm gonna hit you offline on some of these things. Georgetown. It's a lot of fun. Well, I'm gonna have to hit you offline on some of these things because, uh, yeah, they're, I'm weaving them into this next uh, next novel that comes out in May. But um, before I get into asking you about Hamas and, and Hezbollah in particular, um, having been in Gaza back then when you were doing that in the late '90s, what was your impression when you first went from Israel into into Gaza, uh, just looking around, the smells, the sights, the feelings. What was your what was your feeling of Gaza? How different was it once you stepped over that line back then? I mean, knowing that this is the late nineties and it's maybe different today. That first time I went to Gaza Strip, nineteen ninety seven, it was like going into a different world. Um, and uh, you know, you, you didn't have the investment that came and 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 then got destroyed and rebuilt again, destroyed and rebuilt again. Uh, uh, as, as Hamas began to use it for base for operations later. Um, uh, I was keen on going in and out. The advice I'd been given was, don't not go, go, but don't stay overnight. Uh, so I went in early one morning and uh, did not get out before dark, but we got out uh, and, and it was it was telling. Um, I uh, um, didn't get to see much of the strip. You know, we we're going from meeting to meeting to meeting, you know, you know, big names, security people that people who follow regional will recognize. Um, 
We did, uh, by we, I mean me, my, my translator and fixer and her American fiance. Um, and, uh, we, we did stop, um, and, and go to a kind of a, a very nice, very beautiful fish restaurant on the water for lunch, but it was kind of like the exception. In subsequent trips, you know, I, in 1997, I was just a, I was just a student walking around with my, you know, student ID trying to get access to people. Um, and I think one of the reasons I got such access is because it was all new. No one was coming and asking them anything yet. Um, when I went back uh, a few years later, I was I was in government, and it was a different type of experience. You know, you're you're, you're going in in up armored, you know, suburbans, um, and um, uh, we were going to meet with people in some of the then brand new facilities that your and my taxpayer dollars paid for. But I, I have over here in my office a collage of pictures from that particular trip. It was a variety of different countries in the region. And one, one of the pictures is uh, with three little boys. I had three at the time. I have, I have four. They're not so little now. But uh, the three boys were about the same age. And these three, we, we got there early. And we stopped at the edge of the Shati refugee camp, the beach refugee camp in northern Gaza. And um, there was three, these three boys playing in the beach. It was a filthy beach. Filthy dog playing with them, filthy tennis ball, barefoot. And it was it struck me, you know, there but for the grace of God, I could have been born here. This could have been, you know, and you know, that that picture stays on my wall. Um and uh I feel for people who are right now stuck living under Hamas, people without agency, you know, it, you'll hear people say, Oh, everyone in Gaza is Hamas, everyone's responsible. Well, it's not true. I think Tank published a whole a couple of weeks ago, some data we collected in the, in the summer showing that over 70% of the residents of the Gaza Strip wanted Hamas out, wanted Hamas disarmed, and not support Hamas fighting Israel. You can you can imagine that, you know, you and I are living in comfort here. We can come up with our principal positions and stick with them. People who are living in Gaza Strip and are being bombarded right now don't have that luxury. And I imagine if they were pulled today, they'd say something different. Um, but the fact is, you know, you have to feel not only for what happened to people on October 7th, of what's happening to people in the Gaza Strip right now. Yeah, I oftentimes feel like I won the lottery just being born in the United States. Um, podcast, it's it's strange to say you love a podcast on, on terrorism, so I want to say that it is very well done. It is incredibly informative, and I want to encourage everybody to listen to it. Breaking Hezbollah's golden rule, which is the less you know, the better, and your podcast and you out to to change that. Um, so incredibly informative. Uh, people are hearing a lot about Hamas right now, obviously. And then they're hearing, you know, as they walk by the TV and taking care of their kids or going about their day, whatever they're doing about Hezbollah. And they probably kind of know that uh, Hezbollah might be in the north and Lebanon, maybe remember that. Uh, Hamas, Gaza, maybe some other places too, they think possibly. But I was wondering if you could give me a breakdown on, uh, and listeners a breakdown of the history of Hamas juxtaposed to to Hezbollah, uh, maybe going back to that, what is really a very seminal year in the history of the region and the world around 1979, a lot of things happening at that that point in time, but uh, kind of those embers of, of Hezbollah and uh, and take us up to today, if you could. All right, you were listening to me to understand how big a question that is, because yes, it's, it's a big question, but maybe the question which one predates both organizations. Hamas is founded in December 1987 in the Gaza Strip. And Hezbollah is founded in Lebanon in 1992. But it does make sense to kind of, you know, scroll back a second. 1979 is the Iranian Revolution. It's also uh, the uh, beginning of the uh, jihad in Afghanistan. There's also the takeover of uh, the holiest site in the Islamic faith by Sunni Islamic fundamentalists. And the Saudis can't handle it themselves. They're bringing French special forces, non-Muslims, not only to come to the country, but to come to the, the holiest site in the Islamic faith. It was extremely tumultuous. And what's most important for Hamas and Hezbollah is that when Iran uh, has its revolution, um, it, it brings with it, the Ayatollah brings with him a, a particular innovation that in Persian, in Farsi, is Waliyat al the rule of the jurisprudence. Previously, there was this position within Shia Islam, which is one of the two main sects, Sunni and Shia, the Iranians are Shia, um, that the religious leaders would stay in their seminaries and politicians would be politicians. 
and the revolution brought this this idea that you know only the most qualified um theologians could be the mouthpiece of god on earth and create god's kingdom on earth and that can only be done by the appropriate theologian which of course was he himself um the second part of that is this idea that the revolution was not only intended for iran it was never intended to commit iran's borders it was to be exported and so iran immediately created agencies and departments to export that revolution and this was only interrupted because of a small thing called the iran iraq war but suddenly iran had to move all its capabilities to defend itself from the war that iraq started and then later when the iraqis seemed willing to stop iran said hell no we're going to take the fight to you now it was a, a horrendous horrendous war it was only after that that iran really got into the business of trying to export its revolution again it had been doing terrorism during the iran Iraq war but mostly targeting israel or targeting other countries that were perceived as often were in fact supporting iraq during the iran Iraq war or helping um oil tankers reflag under the kuwaiti flag so a lot of targeting of American interests or French interests or Kuwaiti interests, et cetera. Um, so there's lots of things that have changed over the years. The one thing that is constant is that Iran is the primary state sponsor of both Hamas and Hezbollah. And that Hamas and Hezbollah, though Hezbollah is Shia and Hamas is Sunni, work very, very closely together. Now, we're all very focused on Hamas right now because of the horrific attack of October 7th and the horrific war that has ensued as Israel tries to dislodge Hamas from its safe haven and governance project in the Gaza Strip. But you need to remember, Hamas is a tiny fraction in size and in capability compared to Hezbollah. Hezbollah is the big, big threat. And so one of the things you'll, you know, you'll be able to watch the Israelis trying to navigate is keep the North as calm as possible. If the Hezbollah shoots anti-tank guided missiles into some cities, the Israelis have to evacuate towns and even Kiryat Shimon, which is a city of, I don't know, 20, 25,000 people in the north, which they have. Okay, so that we can deal with what we got to do in the south. Um, but they're kind of very, very carefully trying to calibrate that. And in the past two days, there's been an uptick uh, with Hezbollah shooting more rockets, farther rockets, hitting some civilian targets, primarily so far they've been hitting military targets, and the Israelis ratcheting up their response. Um, Hezbollah has somewhere between 150 and 200,000, let's call them rockets. At the low end, some of them are probably more like projectiles. And at the high end, we're talking probably, I don't know, maybe 300 or so really sophisticated, uh, smart, long range, large warhead rockets. Most of the rockets are not, and they're fired in the direction of a community. Some of them at these, you know, these top end 300 are fired not at a community or a neighborhood or a block or a building, but a window, and are very, very dangerous. Um, and Hezbollah also has many more fighters, a, a lot more skill. They they, 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 dis, they dispatch you know, several thousand fighters over the past few years to defend the Assad regime in Syria. And so that is that is a, a really dangerous point of escalation. And then finally, Iran over the years has tried to build together what we sometimes in the U.S., kind of terrorism community referred to as the Iran threat network, uh, Iran and its proxy networks. Um, and that includes not only the Hamas and the Palestinian Islamic Jihad and the Palestinian context and Hezbollah in Lebanon, but also the Houthis in Yemen, even though they're not as ideologically close to Iran, the various Iraqi Shia militia groups, the Hashd al-Shabi in, in Arabic, and many of the groups have been kind of threatening to in one way or another join the fight against Israel. The Houthis have, in fact, been firing rockets, including ballistic missiles at Israel. Some of them landed in Egypt, and some of them were shot down. Some of them were shot down by a U.S. ship in, in the Red Sea. Some of them were shot down by the Israeli uh, arrow system, which is an incredibly sophisticated system that shoots these things down when they're in the lower part of the space atmosphere. And at least one was shot down by the Saudis. Um, and uh, clearly Hamas thought that these other proxies would do more. There's still the opportunity that they might. Um, but frankly, you know, Hamas is the runt of the Iran threat network litter. The fact that Hamas could bring the region to the, to the, to the cusp, hopefully it will just be to the cusp of regional war, tells you how serious the threat is from Iran and its proxies in, in the future. And finally, as you said, you know, Hezbollah in particular, it's in Lebanon, it's, it's got activities 
throughout the region. That episode in my podcast that that landed last week was on Hezbollah activities in the Gulf. Um, you know, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, etc. Um, but Hezbollah has activities around the world. We've had Hezbollah cells here in the United States. I've testified as the government's expert witness in several of them. Uh, just the other day, Brazilian authorities worded what they believe is a Hezbollah plot either to carry out attacks targeting Israeli Jewish targets in Brazil and or using Brazil as a launching pad to elsewhere in South America. And they just released the name of the, the recruiter that they um, identified. And, you know, it, it shouldn't surprise that, that as part of what Hezbollah is going to be doing in the region, you know, if, if Hezbollah fires something at Israel, Israel sees where it came from, they fire back. Sometimes Hezbollah, sometimes Iran, they like to do things with what they call reasonable deniability. Doesn't mean that you don't know that I did it. This means you can't exactly prove it. It's more difficult for you to go full fledged war against me. What are you going to do about it? And so, you know, you, you send some terrorist operatives to, to Rio or elsewhere, um, and uh, there's lots of targets. And, you know, this is something we're concerned about. I want to ask you about that sleeper cells, sleeper agents in the United States, some of those um, uh, trials that you have been uh, an expert witness on. Um, but before I, I get to that, do you think that Hezbollah is in a position in that they see, let's say they see Hamas really uh, fighting back hard against Israel as Israel goes in and there's a lot of Israeli casualties? Does then Hezbollah think they need to get in on that, quote unquote, victory or the opposite they see israel go in decimating hamas do they feel like they need to then stand up and uh and do more it seems like either way at some point hezbollah does more than just throw a few rockets over that border i don't know i was gonna i want to make i want to ask you what your thoughts were on that hezbollah would love to get involved in this war all right but hezbollah is in a complicated position First of all, it understands that unlike the last war it had with Israel in 2006, which Hezbollah describes as a divine victory, victory by virtue of not being decimated, the first Arab army not to be completely destroyed by Israel. They understand the Israelis have kind of changed how they're going to fight the next war in Lebanon, whenever it would next come. And the Israelis would tell me over the years, look, we want calm on the border. We understand that some point that Hezbollah is not collecting these rockets as paperweights, but <clears throat> I'm not going to do it unless we have to do it. Hezbollah understands that the Israeli response is going to make what's happening in Gaza look the child's play. And Lebanon already is suffering from a tremendous political crisis, a horrific economic crisis. Hezbollah is still on its back legs, both for kind of dragging Lebanon into the Assad Syrian civil war by getting involved, even when Hezbollah had said no one should get involved, and then more recent things like the uh, Beirut explosion, which was a big stockpile of ammonia nitrate, part of the port controlled by Hezbollah. And then Hezbollah's done everything it can to undermine that investigation at every turn. The bigger thing, though, is that Hezbollah has all these rockets from Iran. And the other chapter that's happening that hasn't ended is tension over Iran's nuclear program. And Iran wants Hezbollah to have those rockets. And the, to A, is a deterrent against the United States or Israel or anybody to try and go take out components of that military program militarily, and B, if they do, to have that option as a second strike option. So Iran, as much as Iran wants Israel destroyed, also doesn't want Hezbollah to kind of lose too much of its capability right now. However, and I, I've been saying this and writing it a lot since October 7th, and, and I this is a not just for others, it's a big mea culpa, right? All of us need to reassess our assumptions um, and our paradigms because none of us who follow Hamas and Hezbollah closely uh, anticipated that Hamas would do anything like it did in October 7th. Even though the Hamas Deputy Secretary, Secretary General Sal Khalilouri in August said, you know, we're, we're planning for a regional war. <clears throat> I saw it. Lots of other people saw it. We took it as, you know, we, we talk. Um, you know, when, when you don't have a lot, it's like, like when I play basketball, you can't see it because on Zoom, I look like I'm a, you know, I'm five foot six, right? When I played basketball in high school, I, I was scrappy and I had a great trash talk game. So we kind of thought that's what was going on here a little bit. We were wrong. We were terribly, painfully wrong. And so I keep saying to others, and I keep saying to myself, I think that those two kind of analytic perspectives on Hezbollah still stand, but that 
but that can't be all of it, right? So at what point does Hezbollah decide, look, we cannot afford for Hamas to be decimated, we're going to get in and do more. Maybe not the, the war to end all wars, but do more. At what point does it maybe if things go badly for Israel? Does Hezbollah decide, hey, it's time to get in on the great victory? For years now, the head of Hezbollah, Hassan Nasrallah, has been saying Israel is weaker than a spider's web. And then things started happening that, to his perspective, vindicated his prediction. Uh, societal tensions in Israel, huge political tensions in Israel, um, you know, reservists and key units like the Air Force saying, you know, maybe we don't come for training. And look, you know, Hamas has done more than anybody ever could to, to bring Israelis together across the spectrum, not only by virtue of doing October 7th, but the people they targeted on October 7th were far left, the most pro-peace, right? Um, but maybe Hezbollah starts really believing its own propaganda, even though Israel is now very, very kind of united and circled the wackums and all that. Maybe at some point, Israel says, you know what? Uh, you know, this is a theological organization. They believe that they're doing God's work. Um, when you when you believe that, you know, you're the one chanting God's message, God's message, you know, you, you take bigger risks. And finally, I think in general, we in the United States, the West in general, but certainly we in the United States, and I say this as a former U.S. government official, we tend to look at our adversaries who make calculations that are legitimate but different than ours, and we think that they're, you know, that's wrong. So we keep getting caught off guard by China, by Russia, by North Korea, by Iran, by terrorist groups, because we wouldn't do what they're doing. And that what it boils down to is a difference in how we assess risk and we assess um, uh, the dividends. Um, so we tend to not do things if there's too much risk, and certainly not do things if we're not going to get really big benefits out of it. And they will assume more risk for fewer benefits or, or the potential of benefits that aren't guaranteed. And so we constantly get ourselves, you know, surprised. Um, and so under the circumstances, I think we also need to assume that maybe Hezbollah or others in the Iran threat network decide to take much greater risks in an effort to really just change the whole system. That's clearly what this was all about. Change the entire system. It's clear now from reporting the New York Times and Washington Post and other things that Hamas really wanted to create something very, very big. Um, and just you know, completely changed the dynamic in the region, which is very much to Hamas and Hezbollah's uh, way of thinking as well. Now, did I, maybe it was something you wrote, but uh, has Hamas sent operatives up to Lebanon to train with Hezbollah or to Iran or both? Yeah. So Hamas has sent operatives to train in Iran over the years. There's reporting that they did that before October 7th, but there's nothing concrete yet. You know, the Gaza Strip is kind of enclosed, but there are tunnels you can get out to Egypt. People have been able to travel. Um, and certainly uh, with Hezbollah over the years, um, Hamas has a leadership cadre in Lebanon and in Qatar and in Turkey. They did in Syria for many years. And then when they broke with the Syrian regime over the Assad regime, you know, butchering fellow Sunnis, they closed that office now trying to reopen it. Um, but Hamas has been building up an operational capability in Lebanon. There are Palestinians in Lebanon. There are large Palestinian refugee camps in Lebanon. There have always been people aligned with one Palestinian faction or another in those camps. That's not new. What is new is under Hezbollah's tutelage and uh, with their permission, and presumably with their arms, Hamas has been building up the capability to try and either reach the fence itself or shoot rockets. So last June, there were rockets fired at Israel. It was a big surprise. People didn't think Hezbollah would do it. In the end, it wasn't Hezbollah. It was Hamas. Now, you can't burp in that part of southern Lebanon without Hezbollah's okay. There's no way Hamas kind of just got those rockets on their own. But it was Hezbollah trying to find a way to kind of take a step back, maybe a meter or a foot or two of distance. No, it wasn't us. It was Hamas. Some of the rockets that were fired farther into Israel than Hezbollah has been firing them that were fired over this weekend were claimed by Hamas. Um, so that is, you know, another way that Hezbollah and Hamas are working together in a way that Hamas is trying to ratchet up pressure. There's also been a lot of activity in the West Bank, uh, both from Hamas and other militants trying to, to do things there and the Israelis and, for that matter, the Palestinian Authority have been cracking down on that. And then there's also been a really disgusting uptick in Jewish extremist and terrorist activity in the West Bank. 
Uh, and I've been calling that out all week, uh, which is very, very dangerous, not only for the obvious reasons, when you have you know, extremist terrorists or targeting civilians, it's bad, whatever their background or ideology. But this has, excuse me, this has the potential to really kind of inflame the West Bank at just the wrong time. Hmm. And Hezbollah in Lebanon, how involved are they now in politics and government? So Hezbollah has the best of all worlds. Hezbollah is both part of the Lebanese government and apart from the Lebanese government. Hezbollah exists as its own organization and movement. Hassan Nasrallah, the head of Hezbollah, holds no position within the government of Lebanon, but makes decisions of life and death, of war and peace for Lebanon that the leaders of Lebanon have no say about, as the acting prime minister recently said. Um, but they hold positions within the government, uh, mm -hmm. and that enables them to direct government funds to things they want or to block things that the government might, might, might do that might not be in their interest. Uh, right now, they're blocking the formation of a government at all. Um, so they kind of have the best of, of all worlds. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to ask you about going back uh, in history a little bit to founding of Hezbollah, those embers we talked a little bit about earlier, um, suicide bombings, V-bids, v vehicle born IEDs um, over the years up to the point where they start to export that terrorism out of the Middle East. So what was that? What was that? like that evolution of Hezbollah in particular um, from those early days from 1979 embers on through the 80s into the 90s when we start to see it in places like Argentina and other places around the around the world. So Hezbollah was not the original architect of suicide bombings or uh, big vehicle born improvised explosive device VBIDs. Uh, that actually the Tunnel Tigers, but that was kept within that um, uh, conflict Hezbollah in, adopted, in Sri Lanka. Pardon? In Sri Lanka, right. Hezbollah adopted the tactic and really kind of built it out and exported it. Um, and so you first saw uh, Hezbollah carry out, um, you know, some of the largest explosives, non-nuclear explosions on planet Earth at the time, in terms of the Marine Barracks bombing, the bombing of the U.S. Embassy, then the bombing of the U.S. Embassy Annex. These were all told in an 18-month period in the early 1980s. Uh, you see Hezbollah carrying out bombings, targeting U.S. and other interests, but mostly U.S. and Kuwait. Um, you see uh, smaller Hezbollah bombings in France, and then Hezbollah operatives trying to bring explosives, liquid explosives, and in wine bottles through airports in Germany to resupply, and they're getting arrested. Now Hezbollah is starting to target out, carry out hijackings and shootings and kidnappings in Lebanon, in part to secure the release of its comrades. It starts getting very, very complicated. And then Hezbollah sports this beyond the region, and we see the 1992 bombing of the Israeli embassy in Buenos Aires. But a year and a half later, the uh, bombing of the Amia Jewish Community Center, also in Buenos Aires. A lot of people have heard of those. Most people have not heard that just a few months before the Amia bombing, and earlier in 1994, Hezbollah came this close to blowing up the Israeli embassy in Bangkok. And the only reason that didn't go forward is because the suicide bomber got into a fender bender on his way to work that morning. Um, it's an incredible story. Uh, there's a whole episode of the podcast about it, so I'm not going to spill the beans here. But uh, we interview uh, an, an Israeli intelligence operative that was on the ground at the time and a Thai counterterrorism police operative all around the world. You know, you spin the globe, stop at a country or a continent, and I'll, 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 I'll tell you a long list of stories there. It's, and you can find it. We have an interactive map on our website, WashingtonInstitute.org, on as well as worldwide activities. Um, so this is one key tactic. It's not the only one. More recently, Hezbollah built up a an army, a militia. They call it the Islamic Resistance, on Mukawam al Islamiyah, and it's very capable, highly trained, and by virtue of fighting in Syria in coordination with Iranian forces, learning how to work with air cover from the Russians. You know, they've learned a lot of different things, and they've got a lot of different systems, some very sophisticated systems, and they are forced to be reckoned with. Well, speaking of worldwide, in the United States, I want to shift gears a little bit here and uh, ask you why we, like I mentioned earlier, um, you have been an expert witness in a few of these different cases, but why is it so hard to dig into 
cases in the United States in particular that uh, are terrorism related, but the charges are for other things like the uh, like Al Capone and taxes. But it's not even that big. It's like, hey, we have a this person has a handgun and he's not supposed to have one type of a thing. But wait a sec. Is this a terrorism case? And you have to really dig to find out, oh, this is a terrorism case. Not only is it a terrorism related case, it's related to Hezbollah. And there are confessions that are thrown out. There are sealed cases that then become unsealed later on. Um, why is it so hard to find out how many terrorism related cases there are in the United States? And why can you not just listen to what the Department of Justice says when they read out that they got this person and this person uh, and then the public's distracted? But there are another hundred that aren't in the DOJ press releases. Um, why, why is that? There are a bunch of factors here. Um, the first is that Hezbollah is quite good at operational security. Um, they learn resistance to interrogation, RQI, which, as you well know, in the real world is not about never speaking, but by, you know, a week or two weeks or a month for anybody else to pack up and get out. So you have a bunch of cases um, abroad, really, where, you know, in one case where a guy pretended to be uh, deaf and mute for a month. I mean, imagine the, 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 the discipline that that takes. And then the interrogators, this is in Iraq, and interrogators come in and one day he's like, hey, you want to talk? Imagine the, the shock. You know. um, here in the United States, it's it's often difficult to convert the intelligence into evidence that can be used uh, in open court. Um, if some of that information comes from foreign partners, that becomes especially difficult um, to convert. Um, Again, they tend to be pretty good at their operational security. So it's not like in the movies where they, you know, they, they make the state down the phone and they're like, hey, when's the next Hezbollah meeting? Um, once upon a time, you would have that type of thing, but um, but but not so much now. And then finally, Hezbollah is involved in so much criminal activity, especially here in the United States, where a lot of it really is about just using the United States as a cash cow. Everything from credit card bust out schemes to cigarette smuggling to um, you know, uh, fake checks and insurance fraud and, and you name it, that, you know, prosecutors want to get convictions. And if I've got you dead to rights on um, some type of criminal activity or conspiracy that's been history for a long time, and I don't have to get into the terrorism bit, which is inherently political or will be made to seem political by the defense, right? Um, uh, that, that just complicates things. So you're going to have a, the overwhelming majority of cases that involve people that were doing things on behalf of Hezbollah or to benefit Hezbollah will not have the word Hezbollah or terrorism in there. And then we've had some cases uh, in the United States or elsewhere that it just becomes difficult to prove. One of the cases I testified in most recently, Alexei Saab, he was convicted on some terrorism-related charges, but acquitted on others. And in that case, the Department of Justice chose not to retry him on, no, I'm sorry, not acquitted, acquitted on some but uh, hung jury on the most significant material support charge. And they, they decided not to retry him on that because he was already getting a significant sentence. And in Peru, another case where I testified, you know, at one point, the court said, we're going to throw out his confession. A higher court said, no, no, you should include the confession. And then the lower court went back, retried him again, and again decided to throw out the confession. And so that's kind of, you know, going along at a snail's pace. Yeah, the Alexei Saab, um cases were very interesting. So he got 12 years, I think, but he could have had over a hundred uh, is what was, was on the, on the table. I think he ended up getting 12 years. Um, I, I wanted to ask you about him because it's very interesting. So he's new, a New Jersey guy. He's, he's scouting locations, I think in Boston and New York and DC and Empire State Building, uh, 26 Federal Plaza, Rockefeller Center. Uh, look, and essentially he's doing a target analysis and he's looking for the, the softest targets, the most, uh, that'll, where a bomb would cause the most amount of casualties is my is my understanding. Please correct me yeah, if I'm choke if points. wrong. But uh, very so cre recruited in '96 at a university in Lebanon, I believe. Starts out doing some maybe lower level surveillance type stuff on the border, looking at uh, Israeli units, movements, that sort of thing. Then goes to his first Hezbollah sponsored training course. Uh, formerly recruited, I think, near the end of of that or just after just after that. Um, but very interesting that. He flies from, becomes a U.S. citizen, uh, goes from Lebanon to Turkey to the U.S., has explosive residue detected in Turkey, gets questioned, gets let go, 
And I guess they let the U.S. know that, hey, we found this, or maybe it's some part of a network or something like that. He lands. The U.S. authorities question him, also let him go, hopefully smart enough to maybe start some surveillance. I don't know. I was curious what you if, if you if that that happened, if they just let him go or if they're like, hey, let's let him go and see where he goes. I, I don't know. Um, but uh, I wanted to talk to you about uh, that case and because it's fascinating. And I think you're the expert, wit one of the expert witnesses there. But uh, that is fascinating because it has all these different elements of somebody infiltrating another society, communicating back and forth, traveling back and forth, doing this close target reconnaissance. Uh, it has all these elements and he's caught. And yeah. then kind of let go in 12 years ish thing. I'm probably going to get out one before. Of the reasons, one of the reasons they were able to get him at all is because you know, he, he talked. Uh, the case, the, the case right before him, Ali Karani, the same thing, he talked. Uh, and so I think, you know, the, the future case, I think, the, you know, they're, they're, they're a learning organization. You know, they're, they're just not going to talk to the FBI at first. Um, look, I got to tell you, I'm, I'm originally from Boston. I'm a fire breathing, frothing at the mouth Red Sox fan, which I guess is repetitive. It's the only way we come. He took surveillance of Fenway Park. Now, mind you, didn't do that Nick Stadium. But okay, anyway, I'm just saying. Um, and he sent all this stuff back to his handler. He highlighted choke points and you know ways to maximize damage, not because they were planning something tomorrow, but Hezbollah has a really developed modus operandi of having off-the-shelf planning so that if, it wasn't Alexis Saab who said that, but as Ali Karan made the case before him, and he said um, to the FBI, you know, under what case situation they said, do you think that you'd be called upon to act? And he described himself as a sleeper uh, agent. It's not a term I typically use. Uh, and he said, look, if the United States were to do something directly undermining the core interests of Iran or Hezbollah targeting the senior official, like I could see it then. This was before the U.S. took out Qasem Soleimani, right? Um, it was after the U.S. had partnered with Israel to take out the mastermind of Hezbollah's terrorist wing, the founder of their Islamic Jihad organization, Imad Wadmiya, in 2008. Um, and so it's it's really disconcerting, even if it's not for an operation to happen next week or next month, to know that Hezbollah's got really detailed maps and plans of, you know, train stations and uh, federal buildings and, you know, sports venues. And that's, that's, that's a real problem. Uh, and so I, I, the FBI takes it very, very seriously. You know, when he was alerted on... Um, um, you know, it was a it was very slight residue, and it wasn't enough to kind of prevent him from getting on the plane when he left Turkey. But obviously, Turkish authorities informed U.S. authorities. U.S. authorities um, did uh, you know did, did did what you'd expect they do. You know, so they they uh, interviewed him, and uh, it wasn't enough to hold him. But like they didn't just let him go and say goodbye. Uh, and I think that's why you know fast forward, he, he ends up in a court in the Southern District of New York on that and some other issues. Um, but what's really telling is that at the end of the day, the jury did not find him guilty on all the surveillance. It was a technical thing. The FBI had kind of agreed that at a certain point, he kind of dropped off from Hezbollah. And I think the jury kind of felt like, well, if he's no longer Hezbollah, why are we holding him accountable for things he did for Hezbollah before? What he was convicted on, there's a specific charge for uh, uh, obtaining military-style training from a foreign terrorist organization. And he 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 did he 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 just got all kinds of training from as well. Uh, but he's really interesting as some as are some of the other cases in terms of like you know, starting off young, you know, spotted recruited in college. He's from the south. They say, okay, well, while you're there, just kind of let us know when you see Israeli you know, military movements around in Lebanon across the border. He seems to do well, get spotted, selected. Eventually, you know, okay, now we'll, we're going to take you in beyond a larger Hezbollah family into the much smaller, tighter Islamic Jihad organization family, see if he can get citizenship. Okay, let's go to New York, let's go to New Jersey. Um FBI is very, very conscious of these cases. And 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 for good reason, you know, as when as as the region right now is, you know, really, really tense. And people around the world are reacting in a very, very, very visceral way, both to uh, on the one side, the October 7th Hamas massacre, and to the Israeli Defense Forces incursion into Gaza, mostly talking past each other. When when I wish people could say, you know, what happened on October 7th was heinous and unfathomable, and I really, really feel for innocent Palestinians in the Gaza Strip, that's where I sit. Most people are not able. They can see one side or the other. 
But within that milieu, the potential <clears throat> for Hamas or Hezbollah, especially Hezbollah, to be able either to carry out operations of their own, to recruit people, is really, really, really disconcerting. You look at this case in Brazil, again, it's early days, but it looks like a Hamas guy who's a Syrian-Brazilian dual citizen, a Hezbollah guy, recruited some low-level Brazilian criminals who are not Muslim, who are not Lebanese or Syrian, who are not Hezbollah operatives, and offered them money to carry out some attacks and to recruit others. And in the context of people being really angry about Israel, or on the other side, angry about Hamas, I imagine it's going to be easier to do that. Yeah. And uh, I do want to ask you about uh, Lexi Saab, because you were involved in that in that case. Do you think that when he is tested, perhaps tested, or perhaps it's an actual mission uh, in Lebanon, and his handler gives him a pistol and says, hey, go kill this. This person's an Israeli spy. Go shoot him in this van, twice in the stomach, once in the head. And he goes over there, and the, the pistol doesn't work, or it malfunctions, maybe. Do you think that that really malfunctioned, or do you think that it was a test hey, to see if this guy's really, is he working for the Israelis, or is he working for us? There's no way to know. Um, yeah. I don't think the government knows, right? But ultimately, his, he and his handler drove to this place. The Senate says there's a gun under your seat. There's a guy in that car up there who's been spying for the Israelis. Put two bullets in him. And I don't know if it was a test. I don't know if the gun really jammed. All we do know is that Alexei Saab said, okay, took the gun, went over there, click, click twice. No bullets came out. And they get off. You know, whatever it was, it, it, it demonstrated that when asked to assassinate someone, that Hezbollah believed it was providing information to Israel, Alexei Saab was willing to do it. Yeah. Now, in a couple of minutes we have left, uh, the Karani case, traveling to China um, to develop relationships to get chemical precursors for ammonium nitrate bombs or or whatever else they're, they were going to do there. Uh, I think he eventually got 40, 40 years. But what does that, what does that tell you uh, as an analyst with your background and understanding that these people are going, or this one person in, 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 goes to, to China and then comes so back? There's a particular we'll, we'll issue here, and that is that Hezbollah has developed a very defined modus operandi over the past few years of collecting disposable ice packs. You know, your kid goes to a soccer practice, twists his or her ankle, coach comes out with the, the, the ice pack, you, you punch it, you break the membrane, shake it real good, it's cold for 20 minutes. Well, basically, half of that is mostly what you need to make an ammonium nitrate bond. But you have to have a whole lot of them. So this is what they used in the bombing in Burgas, Bulgaria, the Israeli tourist bus. It's what they were planning to use, and it stockpiled a huge, huge amount of in a basement of a safe house in Cyprus. It's what they've been procuring in the UK and procuring and moving across different countries uh, in Europe. Uh, in my podcast, I get into a case of a guy procuring ice packs for Hezbollah ammonium nitrate precursors in Houston, Texas. I'm going to ask in you about him. Case, Robert, Robert Asaf, is that? That's uh, right. Saying? That's right. In this case, it turns out that the number one largest company in the world making these ice packs is in Guangzhou, China. And so Hezbollah basically comes up with an idea. What if we have a guy in the U.S. who gets U.S. citizenship? Now, we haven't got a U.S. passport. You get a U.S. passport, you're, you're asked, right? do you have any plans to use it right away? And he said no. But immediately on getting the passport, he applies for a visa to China. He goes to China with another guy who he claims, oh, I didn't know his name. You know, he, he was the son of a friend. Like, that's a long flight. Like, you know, you're traveling with someone, you're going to know what their name was. Uh, he claimed he was a, a medical device salesman. He was a student. But anyway, according to the Department of Justice, he was trying to negotiate a deal to procure large uh, amounts of uh, these ice packs at a discount rate. And there's no evidence he succeeded. But again, it shows uh, how creative um, militant groups can be. Um, and instead of trying to you know, procure C4 or other things that people are going to watch more carefully, Someone forgot, oh, wait a minute, you know, TATP is really volatile. You don't want to be driving over a speed bump with that stuff, but you know, nitrate's a little more stable. And actually I can I can get that real easy. This is like the the the, the, the supreme dual use product. I mean, it's got this you know very common purpose. It's already prepackaged that way. Um and uh they've been doing this around the world. Um and apparently even Houston Texas. In, in that Houston, Texas case with the soft, what um, why did the judge seal 
that case is because they were hoping to, hoping to get him to cooperate and lead him have him lead us to more cell members if he knew anyone if uh if that that golden rule had been broken you know they, they don't say why they do it but one reason that typically happens in these cases is that the person is cooperating and uh they did have a throwaway line at one point that the reason it had to be sealed is because uh people were fearing for his life and the lives of his family members back in Lebanon which suggests that maybe either he was or there was a prospect of him cooperating and that either ran its course or what have you and ultimately was sealed but as I described in the podcast you know I'm not a journalist I don't want to undermine an ongoing case when I saw this unsealed all of a sudden I actually called someone at the Department of Justice and said, hey, are you aware of this case has been suddenly unsealed? Is that a mistake? Mm-hmm. You know, because if the guy is cooperating and it should be sealed and I go out and I put it out somewhere and got to put his family at risk, like, I don't I don't need that on my conscience. So they said, let me check. And they checked, like, no, uh, we didn't realize, but apparently it's been unsealed. It's fair game. Okay. And then the couple minutes we have left, uh, when you're talking about financial uh, connections and the DEA and drugs and methamphetamine rings that are now funding terrorism around the world, um, was that something that was always on your radar or is that something that's relatively uh, new when we're talking about that in the United States funding terrorism uh, outside our borders? So Hezbollah's role in the drug trade um like this is fairly new. Hezbollah has always been engaged in producing marijuana, hashish, you know, in the Becca Valley. This is different. You had a bunch of low-grade Hezbollah-related criminals who moved to move, uh, South America, and you know, some got in debt, needed money real fast to get out. What's the way you do that? Criminal activity. And they kind of, that's how they got into the industry. And Hezbollah, over time, developed the ability to um, provide some protection, but the biggest thing was laundering the proceeds of uh, narcotics. Uh, and through banks in Lebanon, banks that controlled in Africa, used car sales, uh, in, in incorporating trade-based money laundering schemes into this and, and getting a cut. And so in this regard, Hezbollah isn't producing you know, drugs, but they can move the stuff. Um, and, and, and they're so involved that the Drug Enforcement Administration, the DEA, has been really, really successful infiltrating both Hezbollah and cartels by focusing on the money, including by running sting operations where, you know, it poses the FARC, will you do business with us? And the Hezbollah guys say, sure, you know, posing as some of it. It's just, you know, for them, this is business. And, you know, if it's going to you know, so hurt or undermine the U.S. at some level, then too far. Um, there's a lot of people who overplay Hezbollah in narcotics. A lot of people are saying Hezbollah is responsible for pushing drugs into the United States. Um, that, that's not really accurate. Um, but Hezbollah is very involved, especially in Europe, and in laundering the proceeds of drugs. Got it. Got it. Well, I know I got to let you go. And I want to thank you so much for taking all this time. I want to encourage people to check out that podcast, uh, Breaking Hezbollah's Golden Rule. And uh, sincerely appreciate all your work on this. And uh, um, let's do this again at some point because, uh, yeah, you were an incredible resource. And I thank you for taking the path that you did. Oh, thanks for uh, thanks for having me on. Uh, go write a book. You know, I, 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 I need something to relax with. All right. All right. I'm on it. I'm on it. Well. Thank you. Take care. Thank you for tuning in to the Danger Close podcast, an Ironclad original presented by Navy Federal Credit Union. To find out more about Matthew Levitt, be sure and follow him on X at L-E-V-I-T-T underscore Matt. You can also follow the Washington Institute at W-A-S-H Institute. Also pick up Matt's books, Hamas, Negotiating Under Fire, and Hezbollah, the global footprint of Lebanon's Party of God. And be sure to check out his podcast, Breaking Hezbollah's Golden Rule. You can follow me on the social channels at Jack Carr USA. Officialjackcar.com is the website. Click on shop in the upper right hand corner for the merch. And if you've got something out of this conversation, be sure and leave a five star rating and review wherever you get your podcasts. Until the next time, take care out there. Stay safe. Be strong. Keep fighting.